This interview with gallerist Robert Mnuchin is brought to you by the Macallan, the world's most celebrated single malt whiskey, which is powered by a dedication to mastery. Uh, Robert, thank you for having us to your gallery. It's beautiful. I'm complimented by you wanting to have me, so thank you. Well, I'm very interested to, to hear uh, uh, a lot about the history of the gallery, but especially you were a partner at Goldman Sachs and retired as uh, most partners at Goldman Sachs do uh, in your f 50s uh, and started on another career. M many of your generation probably would have gone into some other part of the financial business, but you chose to open an art gallery. And I'm curious why. I mean, I know you were collecting art to, to begin with, but wanting to deal it is a, a different sort of animal. Well, when you say what many of my partners did, not many of them were there for 32 or 33 years and more or less doing the same thing and specializing it the whole time. And so I was a little bit different in that respect. Secondly, it looks like I left to open an art gallery. I left because it one I knew, I knew, nobody else knew, but I knew like maybe Joe DiMaggio did, I knew that I was a half a step slow, number one. And number two, I'd done the same thing for over 20 years being a block trader. And I think everybody who does something for a long period of time, at times, if they're honest, considers, do I want to do something different? And I did many times, never, never even made a pass at it, but I thought about it for a long time. It took a lot of courage to leave. I mean, it was very, it was very, it was very exciting doing what I was doing. It was very flattering being a partner of Goldman Sachs and especially a partner in the management committee and having all the responsibility and authority. It was hard to give up, but I decided it was worth it because I really wanted to find out. The main reason for leaving was for me to find out for myself how much of what I had done well was me and how much of it was this terrific machine that I had behind me. I wanted to see what could I do on my own. And that was the whole reason at that moment in time. Having left within a short, relatively short period of time, although my wife and I were rebuilding the Mayflower Inn and turning it into a great, a great destination resort and the early parts of being active with it. But I started to think about what am I really going to do with my life? I certainly wasn't going to be a hotelier. And Art became an obvious choice for me. I loved art. I really did. I, I, I loved the experience of being around art and being with art. And I wanted to do that full time. And the part of it that I really wanted to do most that I could tangibly express was I wanted to create exhibitions. And although I think I was pretty good at it, nobody would have considered hiring me. I had no degrees in art. I had no experience in art. They would have laughed at me at any museum or so. So the only alternative was to start my own gallery, which is what I did. And I opened the gallery with something that I knew well, and that was 70s de Kooning. And I've been doing de Kooning exhibitions along with lots of other things to follow along. I think I've done now eight de Kooning exhibitions. You knew 70s uh, de Kooning well because you had been collecting that work or you had been uh, around that work when he was uh, showing it? I think it's an interesting story. I hope you and your viewers will think so. Adriana, my wife, we were really partners in everything, including collecting. Uh, I, th I, from my own experience, both as a collector and now as a dealer, for the most part, one member of a family is clearly the motivator and the leading person in doing things. Not because it's complimentary, just because it's the way it was. We studied art together in books and going to museums, and we bought art together, and they were really, every, everything we bought was a joint decision. The first few things that we bought, inexpensive, because we didn't have a lot of money, um, ended up being hers taste and well, my taste. It didn't take us many years, less than 10 for sure, maybe five, to realize that wasn't a sensible thing to do. But we would never be able to buy as many things as we might consider buying. And so not to have things that we both enjoyed living with was a big mistake. So we, that's where we started really 
quote, owning art pictures that were to, to be forever. I don't, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the word collector. I believe, believe that you hope, hopefully you buy works because you have a passion for that work and having it around you is gonna make your life better. In any event, we were in California. Adriana was there because she had four tennis lady stores in California and I was there because I had three Goldman Sachs offices working very hard, except Saturday afternoon we weren't working. So we went together to an art area and came across a gallery we had never heard of. We just walked into a storefront, the James Corcoran Gallery. And the James Corcoran Gallery, there was a beautiful exhibition. And this is 77, 78. I don't have the year exactly. But it was an exhibition of de Kooning. And we thought they were just absolutely beautiful. We knew de Kooning, and of course, we admired him immensely. And of course, in our own mind, he was completely out of our reach. We would never own a de Kooning because of his importance and the cost. And Adriana said, why, 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 why don't we find out how much these are? I said to her, in a nice way, please don't be ridiculous. This is de Kooning. She said, well, what's it going to hurt you to ask the man? So I went and introduced myself. And in Corcoran, and to my astonishment, they were a fraction of what I would have thought they would have been because they were new and completely different and there seemingly wasn't any immediate market for them. So um, we, we, we bought one. Uh, he did those pictures in that area in three sizes, 60 by 70, 70 by 80, and 77 by 88. This was the small size. 65 by 70 and um, immediately after buying it came back to new york and introduced myself to jim corcoran who coincidentally his gallery his building was exactly the same position as this building one block south of here he was on 77th street but just exactly the same place and i told him how much i liked this painting and we hoped over time to be able to buy more and he said, I have just the painting for you. I said, let me tell you, please, let me tell you immediately that we were able, we were thrilled that we could afford this painting, but we simply can't afford to buy another painting. If we bought it, we would need some serious time to pay for it. Um, and Goldman Sachs partnership is a wonderful thing, but however much you made or didn't make, salaries were very modest and the money had to stay in the firm. You had to either die or leave, neither of which were necessarily something one wanted to do. <laughs> so good options. he said, well, let, let, let's, let's see what you, uh, how much you like the painting. And uh, when I liked the painting very much, which was the next size bigger, uh, I said, I'm still in the same position. I said, I could make a, mo a very modest down payment, but 95% of this I can't pay for. He said, how long would it take you? I said, two years. I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you. He said, let me make a call. He came back five minutes later. He said, congratulations, you bought a painting. And um, that's what really started my, my really serious interest in, in art in general. That intensified everything that I did or we did or brought it to a different kind of level. And uh, de Kooning has been a, a major source of what I've, been, I've done. I've done very, very broad things, but de Kooning. And I brought this catalog along because this is just from 1919. Yep. And it's called Five Decades of de Kooning. And when I look back at this, I think this is probably the most impressive show I've, ever, I've done. This was the show just uh, in the last year or two, right? 1919. Right, 2019. 2019, yeah, really. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. But it's really quite fantastic. No, no, that was an amazing show, and it, and it was kind of um, a capstone to the fact that you've done so many of these de Kooning sh shows. I, and I, I presume you're well connected to many of the de Kooning collectors because you want you had to borrow a number of these works, and and you've you've bought and sold a number of these paintings as a dealer over the well, years. Well, there's, there's a collection in here of eight or ten fabulous works on paper that come from one collection all of which, yes, I placed with that collection, now a museum. And so it was easy, you ask here about my ability to borrow. Clearly that was an easier thing to borrow than most things would be. 
also a very generous people in spirit, the rails. Well, but you, I mean, more than any other dealer, and not that other dealers aren't able to do this, but more than any other dealer, you have access to works from collectors, museums, places to create shows that I think very few people could be able to have that, um, the breadth and trust of so many institutions, especially as a commercial gallery. Is, is that just from the longevity and, and having good relationships with, with people, both institutions and uh, collectors? I think it is relationships. I think at some part the physical space, which is very attractive for exhibitions, I think somehow is the reputation that developed early of doing high class exhibitions that were worth people's attention and lending to them as well as viewing it. And maybe, maybe my background, my Goldman Sachs background helped me in terms of credibility. I think it probably did. They didn't exactly tell me, but I think there was something like that. That you could be trusted not, not to trade on the works uh, 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 too much, and that the, the exhibitions themselves would be, you know, uh, uh, meaningful as exhibitions before uh, as sort of selling opportunities. And that we were small enough to be able to be very careful with every single work. When a big museum borrows a picture, and they have 100 or 125 pictures or something or other, inevitably will paintings get stacked against the wall while they're going to hang it, even when they're very careful. And I'm not saying they're not very careful, but you can be very different careful with 20 works than you can with 320. So, so I think that had something to do with it. And we tried more or less to borrow nail to nail, meaning we took it off the nail there and we had a designated place for it here. So it came in, it was uncrated. Often the requirement was that it sit for 24 hours for climate acclimation, which is, a, I think, a theoretical thing. But in any, in any event, if that's what people want to do, that's what we're going to do. But after that 24 hours, it came out of the crate and onto a nail. It didn't lay around. And I think, like, good word, good news spread, so there's maybe not such good news. So I think those are the kinds of things that helped us. So the, you started by saying one of the motivations was to be able to do shows. Yes. And, and you've done a lot of uh, very interesting shows, thematic ones, with a, a wide range of art, artists. Where do you get the ideas? Uh, are they from you? You know, you wake up one uh, uh, in the middle of the night and think, uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, we're just about to close the church and Rothko uh, uh, show. Do you, you know, sort of wake, wake up one day and say, nobody's ever thought, thought of this? Or is there a process? Well, no. Um, many of the shows are my ideas, not all of them. This one was. Uh, it's interesting for me to share with you how it came about. Someone sent me the red church that's hanging downstairs as you walk in the first picture that you see on the right. Beautiful, beautiful picture. It's to consideration if I wanted to buy it as a dealer. And I looked at it and I said, I can't believe it. The paint in this looks just like the paint that came out of the red Rothko. The way I knew that was the red Rothko that's now hanging next to it is my own personal painting. And really, if you look at it, the tonality of the paints are so similar you think it came out of the same paint can. And so I wondered, in general, Church is a beautiful artist, not in favor today. I mean, in his time, these people were as popular, this group, the leading artists in this group, were as popular as any group's ever been. And it's, it, it, it's interesting how taste at the moment has so much to do with where people will spend money rather than solely on their eyes. I mean, I really believe in having art on your eyes. The reason don't art is because you love it. But, but I'm fascinated that someone was offering you a church to begin with because you had buyers that you uh, uh, have been selling, uh, you know, uh, uh, these kinds of landscape paintings no, uh, to? or just not at all. They I, just took I, a chance? I never, sold, never sold a painting from this period. Just that I have clients and I have good taste and I would be able to appreciate it. And it's difficult to do. It's not a good auction candidate because right now the market isn't, yeah. it's, not, it's not in favor. I mean, this picture could be bought today and probably I would rather not go into the numbers, but for approximately a third of what it traded for, 
15, 20 years ago. And do you think after having uh, many people through the show that, that, that people t have a new appreciation and are thinking about looking at a church now after all? This? Without being a wise ass, it can't be worse. <laughs> Hopefully it's a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> I, look, it is an extraordinary show, and I, I find it hard I mean, to believe that someone didn't walk away thinking... Me too. Me too. I mean, these pictures are simply beautiful in terms of just beauty. What, what do they stand for? What do they represent? That's something different. But in terms of talent and ability, they're, they're just extraordinary in my opinion. But that hasn't been enough for the public at the moment. Well, I'm, I'm actually, as you said about uh, not being able to believe you could uh, uh, get a de Kooning, I'm surprised that, that, that so, someone could get a church these days for such prices. You don't think of it as being something that's uh, accessible or that, that people would be able to buy if they had the, you know, the, the independence of mind to buy one. Right. That's a good phrase. I like that phrase. Independence of mind. That's a good one. Well, that's, you know, this is the, the one of the problems with uh, anything like this where it's about fashion is that people tend to uh, uh, engage with art socially. So if they don't see anyone else uh, owning it, it's an even bigger risk to want to buy a, a painting. And that's, uh, you know, part of the process of what you do here is, is make it uh, uh, better for people to be able to uh, uh, situate a work like that within the kinds of work that have been, um, you know, esteemed like the abstract expressionist, which right. is uh, normally a leap. True. Um, so you're, you sell to a lot of people who over the years were peers of yours, either uh, uh, on Wall Street or at least of, of uh, you know, have a trader's mentality. Uh, and so you have probably better than most people understand what, uh, especially the, the financial tra traders, how they think in terms of what they're uh, buying. Is there that same independence of, uh, of mind? Is it, is it about the money? Is it about the, um, the, the putting together a collection that nobody's seen before or putting together a collection of the things that are better than that other guy they know who has got a pretty good collection? Uh. I like to believe that it's still primarily about what really moves them, but it has to move them within boundaries with which they think they should be moved for the most part. Uh, that's why nobody's come along. Well, that's not true, not nobody. Very few people have come along who are interested in church because it's outside of the boundaries of what they think it makes sense for them to be interested in. Within that, I think they really are much more independent. I think amongst the big collectors, intelligently, a very large percentage of them have advisors, which I think is a good idea. Uh, the art dealer used to be the advisor, used to have that relationship of confidence and advice. And stuff. That's, that's changed over the years, though I'm sure there are exceptions. I'm sure there are a few people with whom I play a somewhat advisory role, if not a complete advisory role. But Basically, no. And so the advisor has to think, this is what we ought to be doing. And this is unlikely. It would take an unusual advisor because the advisor is going to have in the back of their mind, if, he wants, if they decide they don't like this and they want to sell it in six months, what's going to happen? He or she is going to think that's part of their responsibility. And indeed, maybe it is. Who am I to say? I mean, I, I'm an idealist. And I really believe that the reason to buy art is maybe threefold. Certainly that you can afford it. Certainly that you're satisfied within what you're doing. It's, it's high quality and you understand what you're getting. And thirdly, and maybe most importantly of all, that you love it. And you believe that having that in your home or somewhere where you're going to see it on a regular basis is going to make your life more enjoyable. That's the biggest reason, I think, why people should buy art. For, for the sense of the psychic value of, of the pleasure you get yeah, every but day. And not that, that I own a Picasso or not that I own some, somebody. It's that the image itself is something they really adore looking at. Well, I, 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 I always think that's one of the fundamental ironies of uh, museums. It's one of the worst places to experience art is, you know, 
walking into a museum, standing in front of a painting for 10 seconds, and then moving on. I mean, you, 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 the idea that that moment is the moment you're going to uh, uh, experience something with the art, as opposed to, you know, as we, as we sit here, uh, I, I su suppose there are times you're on the telephone and looking across the room, True. and you see something that you I, I like this room for the most part. I enjoy, I, mean, I enjoy the art in this room. I mean, I didn't pick it for this room, but I enjoy the art in this room. Particularly if you take this corner right here, Gustin, uh, Rothko, Rothko, and uh, oh, it's Don Chamberlain. Chamberlain, I I like Chamberlain a lot. I've done a lot, done some with major major Chamberlains. I think Chamberlain is basically an underrated artist. I really do. I just bought this at auction. Well, but isn't that the essence of, of being a dealer, is identifying things that are undervalued or underrated, buying them and either explaining to people why, why they should be valued more? Certainly, more or certainly a serious part of it, for sure. And, and that's, you know, a, 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 it's an arbitrage, you know, it's finding yeah. something that's, that's <laughs> not liked here and is more valued uh, over there and seems to be sort of lost uh, uh, on all, all of this. Um, I was also going to ask you, uh, in that same context of, you know, uh, uh, art advising versus dealing, you, if you're advising a, a collector, a, a, a client, you're in a better position if they, six months later, don't like it to say, fine, I'll take that back, right? I, I, I can think of other people I might sell it uh, to. You can stand behind the work a little bit better than someone who's just advising uh, uh, and, and helping with the transaction, but isn't necessarily able to uh, unwind it. Uh, well, at least I can bring a different intensity and a different caring to it. I just had that experience, actually. I sold a very significant, in terms of money, painting to a man who decided it didn't work and uh, he, <laughs> he was he apologized to me which was surprising but lovely because he knew how strongly I felt that this was a good thing for him to do and he gave it back to me for sale and he said I know that you'll I'm sure you always try hard to sell things but I know that you'll try extra special hard because of the circumstances under which I bought it, which were in large part that I recommended it and to, was stood behind it. And I said, you're right. And I worked on it every day for six months. I sold it yesterday. Congratulations. Yeah, it's, not about, it's not about the money. No, no. I, as a matter of fact, I didn't make much, but that's not the point. I, I was delighted that I was able to get it done because under the, the circumstances that were bigger than just it was in our exhibition, and so that made it, gave it a certain imprimatur. This was something where I specifically really recommended this to him and told him why. So you're right. Well, but you also have a, that reputation as being fair and, you know, uh, aggressive and a, a, a good dealer, but fair and, and making sure that everyone sort of comes out of the deal happy uh, uh, with it, which isn't necessarily the way that this industry is, uh, is thought of, you know, especially at these kinds of, uh, of levels. And the fact that you, you know, you, you take that kind of effort, uh, I suppose, is one of the advantages of, of being a uh, you know, a, a single gallery um, enterprise and not having, you know, multiple uh, uh, places around the world and a large staff. You were talking about the advantages with exhibitions and, and all. I'm assuming also on the trading side, there's a certain element that it's, it's you and, and knowing that you would go out and do the extra work. Well, what I would like to do, what I would like to bring to it is treating people the way if the situation were reversed, I would want to be treated which includes uh, things simple as being very willing to send things on trial to somebody's house, if possible, if it's within my purview to do it, if I'm, and if I'm not restricted by whoever gave it to me. I'm, I'm much in favor of that. I think no matter how much you like or think you like something, seeing it in your own home is different. Well, and I, I presume these are not 
small purchases and everyone has a, a thinking they want something and then when they live with it they may not uh, you know either have a little bit of buyer's remorse or things change i mean uh, that's one of the reasons you exist is five years later someone might decide that that's not their thing uh, anymore or they get a better one or, or whatever. right you're not wrong you're not wrong so y y you I wouldn't say, we we're talking about de Kooning, and I think abstract expressionists are a, a, a sort of area that you're well known for, and I think your um, sort of cohort are, are particularly attached to, uh, to, and those are the works that have become quite valuable over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, and and I wonder if you could you know give me your sense of where that's going. Is have we sort of seen a peak of the abstract expressionists in terms of the uh, market uh, as a as the uh, new generation of buyers sort of going in different directions? I've spent my life assuring people that I'm not a predictor of of markets. So that's not going to change here. But so I don't know where the market is going. If you ask me the importance and what will the, why will the importance be considered, I think the leading abstract expressionists will continue to be increasingly, if anything, increasingly important. Uh, I think that de Kooning is the chairman of the board, personally. Uh, Pollock might be in some people's minds. Pollock is a great, great, great and innovative artist. His drip paintings are phenomenal, but basically he's a one painter Korea. Uh, de Kooning is uh, Picasso-esque. As a matter of fact, he said in a Picasso exhibition standing in front of us, he said, that's the guy to beat. And he, he really has five, at least five totally distinct periods. And I think that really separates him from anybody that didn't have many periods. And nobody else has done that. And in the time that you've been dealing, that late period has especially gone from being work that people, you know, didn't value yeah, to... Yeah, I wanted to show you a painting I asked her. This is a picture that I personally like a lot. That's great. This is, this is 83. Yes. See, I think the 80s... Went like, like every artist has his better days and his lesser days. I think when he's good in the 80s, I think the pictures are simply beautiful. Now, you might say that a smaller percentage of the 80s pictures are terrific than other periods, and that may very well be true. On the other hand, he was old and different changing and stuff. But I think this is a gorgeous. Personally, I find this painting beautiful. No, and this is actually one of the few 80s paintings that you can see some of the 50s sort of shapes and... Uh, you, you, you're very knowledgeable, obviously, you know art. Well, it's just I, I don't think I've seen that many that you can sort of see the same, and there were just a couple of the, them around that you, you've see, well, seen that way. And, you know, they, they don't, they, the, the, the world out there doesn't necessarily come back to the dealer. In the old days, older days, previous days, that would have been almost an automatic. Today, the auction houses are enormous competition for material. And you don't even often don't get to compete. They just their competition is between themselves and the auction house. But anyway, there are collectors who will come back to you. And I'm, well, thr I'm thrilled to have this picture back. So, but but those I mean, over the period, th those went from being paintings no one want, wanted or, or thought were, you know, lesser to become quite uh, sought after. Well, this is a beautiful painting. Yeah, no, no, that's it's a gorgeous... Uh, th that who did it or what it is or anything else. I think it's a beautiful painting, so it deserves... But did you, did it take convincing uh, 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 buyers to, to want to uh, buy works from the 80s? Well, let's see about this one. It was with Xavier the dealer. And then it went to a private collection in Houston. I don't know who that is. And then it came to me, CNM Art, when I was CNM Arts. And I sold it to SCB Communications in San Antonio. And they did come back to me, CNM Arts. So I had it again. And then I placed it with the private, the present collection. And they've come back. So and it's been well exhibited. 
is fun for me. You, you mentioned the auction houses, and I, uh, I know that you, uh, I think on the side from uh, the gallery, but that you also participate in uh, providing guarantees for so, time, some work. And there's been so much sort of fixation on that in uh, uh, covering the market. Uh, I just thought it'd be interesting to get your uh, perspective uh, uh, on it. Is it something when you do that, uh, those are works that you're thinking you can uh, acquire for the gallery and then uh, place? Or is it stuff that you, uh, as a collector or buyer yourself, I mean, uh, is it something you do actively or just when a, a work you know, sort of speaks to you? Well, if anybody thought of me as a financial advisor, I would say the first rule should be that it be something that you'll be happy to own at the guarantee price if it turns out that you're the buyer. That's the first, my first question for myself, and I'm not active-active in this. I do it, but I'm not active-active. Uh, and I think that's what anybody should do. But I think... Occasionally, people guarantee it because if you want to buy the painting, it's a desirable way financially to go. It's a better way to buy the painting than not be in that position. But for anybody else who does it, it is entirely their view that this is an opportunity to make money. It's effectively an auction floor, right? It's a a disincentive for others to to bid because you've already uh, established a pr price, and it's an opportunity for for you to be the the first uh, uh, bidder on, on it. So I assume when you're doing that, acquiring it is almost the easier calculation. At what price am I happy to own uh, the, this painting? As opposed to the other calculation, which is uh, uh, it, this is a good guarantee that will generate you know a, a return. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why not? But but you you made it to, you do it in terms of the stuff that you want to acquire and if it gives no, you a pole I position. I would be happy to acquire. Yeah. Not necessarily that I want to. That's a, a one step beyond. But at least that would be something I'd be happy to buy for my gallery. Now the disadvantage is that when something's been at auction, that price is attached to it. And people are very mindful and very, uh, in, mo in many cases, um, limited in their own mind to how much more than that, would, if any, would they pay. That sort of uh, anchoring, because there's a public price, and so everyone then operates on, uh, uh, operating around it, wh whether they'll pay more or less to, Check. to it. Uh, but you also deal with a number of artists that are almost a field of the artists that you're known for, or certainly of, of the abstract expressionists and uh, uh, de Kooning. And I'm sort of curious to hear how that came about. I mean, in the uh, in the 90s, you were uh, had a couple of shows with Julian Schnabel. You had uh, uh, shows with some other, you know, uh, uh, young British ar ar artists. You've had three shows with David Haymans. Yes, uh, two I'm, or three. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've you've done a couple of um, uh, Sam Gilliam, Ed Clark. I mean, well, the Gilliam Clark is part of a, a new time and a new, you know, learn with the new people. And my partner Sikonia is very good, and she's she's been very right. I remember the first time we went to see um, Hammonds. It was up Upper Broadway, um, Upper Park Avenue, up here. 127th Street or something or other. And after about 10, 15 minutes, I said to her, can we go downstairs? This was long after I'd given up smoking in a previous day period. I was I want to have a smoke. Let's go downstairs and talk for a minute. I turned to her and I said, are you serious that we ought to consider this? She said, I think we absolutely should do this. I think it's terrific. I said, phew. One thing is for sure, if we don't do it, we're never going to get a crack at this artist again. And by the way, this was um, garbage bags. Yep. The show sold out, 75% of which went to museums. She couldn't have been more right. So I take my hat off to her.
and and you were willing to to take a leap of faith with it, with her, right? Yes. Other times I haven't been. She would have had me buy a lot of Gilliam and a lot of other people, where I was more reluctant than showing him to invest a lot of money, wrongfully in terms of the market, in terms of the history of art. We'll see. So. Uh, uh, your own collection, do you still... I don't have, that's too big, strong a stronger word. I don't have enough paintings to be called a collection. I own some nice paintings, but I don't have, truly, I'm not being modest, I don't have a collection. So, you, but you, you still buy and sell paintings for yourself? Personally, no, not really. I, I bought a painting for the first time in a long time. I bought, we have a home in Bridge, uh, Bridgewater, Connecticut, and... Um, I saw here a Clark, Ed Clark, one of the artists that we did and didn't do enough to hold on to. He's not with, I think, Hauser and Worth, I'm not sure. Anyway, I saw a work on paper here that I thought was lovely. So I brought it to Connecticut to show it to my wife. And I mean, I thought it was lovely. So what? I mean, kind of, truly. And she saw it and we put it up where we'd had a, a St. Francis work on paper, which was just beautiful. She said, I love it. Can we please, please get that? I just love it. I said, I'm so excited to hear you be excited about something, of course. So that's the first thing we've bought in a long time. Though we did buy a painting out of a show that we had not so long ago. But we, we don't really buy, buy in, in the very things that I collect, sell. Well, we don't, we're not in that league right now. Uh, because it's the, the, the point of being a dealer is to be with the art uh, uh, as a dealer, but a as a, but as what, a little bit. if you don't have the wall space, if there's no pressing need, there's no, no longer the demand. True. You mentioned some time ago in a, an interview that you'd had a sort of small art fund. It sounded like it was sort of basically some friends who gotten together and you sort of created an art fund. And I used to joke in the high point uh, of art funds 10, 15 years ago that there were many successful art funds. They were called galleries where, you know, right. guys got uh, uh, some funding and they bought and sold and they made money for them and their, their, their partners. Um, and, and I've been curious as the business has grown and people have these larger enterprises, how they're financed. They're, they're certainly not public, and I, I, I don't know that they generate, and maybe they do, enough to expand in the way that they, they do. Is it, you know, silent partners? Is there, you know, a way this I have no idea what other people have done. I don't mind telling you what I did. When I started out, I wanted to have a limited partnership, LP because I wanted to have some number of people who invested what I considered to be a modest amount of money as a vote of confidence in me. And I went, I went to 10 people total. And if they said yes, the maximum they could give was a million dollars. It was also the minimum that they could give. And I think seven or eight out of, out of the 10 said yes. And so we were seven or eight million dollars over the years three or four or five have peeled off just because they peeled off. It's, it's been successful up until two years ago. Every year it was profitable until two years ago. It's been running that long? And, and, and does the, the uh, uh, you disperse some of the profits for, from it or has it grown as the sort of value of art has grown? I mean, the latter, the latter. Um, and we're down to three partners now. And yes, they've been there, it's going on, it's close to 30 years, approaching 30 years. And as I, up until two years ago, every year was profitable. The, the last two years or not. Uh, only because the, the price level has gotten to a point where it's hard to find uh, things and you sort of run, no, run through. No, our or... inventory hasn't depreciated and we haven't made sales. It's been, it's been difficult. And our inventory is, I, I like it, I look at it all the time, I say to myself, was I wrong to do this? And for the most part, I like what we did. But it certainly is out of fashion, it's not in fashion with what we did. 
Well, so timing is one of the most important things in, in all trading, but especially in art tra trading. Right. And you're, you're not wrong until you have to sell at a, a, at a loss. So I assume that in a lot of these cases, it's really finding your right moment, no, the right if, customer. if you had to sell them right now, they would be a loss. If you had to. Right. And there's some beautiful things. But honestly, I mean, uh, I, I hope I don't kid myself. I try very hard not to kid myself. In terms of they attract the bark, yes. Yep. But so is church. Church is fabulous art with very, very little market. And, and so it's the timing, finding the right exit, the person who and wants to buy. This piece is in that fund. Yep. This is Coons from the very best period, the celebration series, early. I paid $9 million for this at auction. I was thrilled with it then. By now, it's closer to unsaleable than saleable. I don't believe, really believe that, but, you know, at least not easily. And Coons' market is soft. I believe that will change, personally, because I think he'll change. I think the reasons why it's particularly soft, and I think he's going to change some of those. Um, but this has historical, in my opinion, some value in a premature from when it was and how it was done and everything else. So I believe this will have be desirable again. And you were involved in one of the sales of the most significant Coonses a few years ago. Well, so you I, I was just, seriously, I was a, I was a... You were a paddle. You raised I, the... I was a paddle. I loved <laughs> throwing it, don't mistake me. I don't want to minimize the personal pleasure, but I didn't have anything to do with it, either the, uh, the, the, the determination to buy it or how high to bid. But, but you were you were there. You I know you there. you were talking to the person who right? you were a part of the advising yes. of, uh, of it. It's not an inconsiderable uh, uh, sum, and you you clearly didn't think it was a, a wrong choice. So it, it's the same as as believing in this piece. You know right. that that it will, and and it's uh, you know well, again. The bunny it's was special. It was really a unique piece in, in, in his career, and even in the in, in the history of what around that period of time. Very, very special. No, and the, the few other editions uh, uh, of that, when you see them, you're reminded about how powerful that, that piece is. It is very. Uh, uh, it really is. Good question. Thank you. I'm glad you asked me. Yeah, no, no. I, look, I, 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 I think, that, again, the I ought to be asking you. You're so interested in art. Tell me, what, what, tell me about your background in art. I, I, I'm a little bit like yours. I like the art. I don't really have that much interest in acquiring it myself. I certainly don't have the means the, the, the way the art is now and a, and a way to be around it and see it. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, um, the, the, what makes things valuable to people, right? Uh, and, and certainly with a lot of the buyers of art, they have plenty of money. The question is, you know, at what point is the money worth less to them than the, the object? Right. And, and seeing how people connect those objects and why, you know, again, the, a, a, a work in, a, in one person's collection may be much more valuable to them in the way it fits with their other works sure. than it is as a standalone object and all. And so that's what interests me is just sort of that whole context and how it works. Interesting. And that's why, again, why you, you know your career is interesting because you come at this it as as both a someone with the same background as a lot of the people you you work with, but also as uh, having the same interests uh, and all, and, and making those choices. I mean, as we were just talking about the bunny, that's like I, I don't think you sat there uh, raising that paddle, thinking, well, this is a dumb thing to 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 do. So you clearly have a a, a strong sense of how to make the choice and. As sort of a final question, uh, Robert, how do you see your legacy? I mean, uh, uh, I don't know what your plans are for, for the gallery or your, or your collection or not collection, uh, the, the art and all, but certainly your role as someone who's operated at this highest level, but focused on the shows and been personally involved in, in, in them. And, and this, this gallery is so much an extension of you, whereas many of the other galleries have gotten so much bigger and broader and, and corporatized, for lack of a better well, term. Listen, the, the, you, that was one of the questions you asked me. 
about not having done estates or representing artists or having expanded to multiple locations. All of that is a different way of life and a different approach to things. And financially, it may have been a very smart thing to do. I think more it was than that. But in terms of what I wanted to do with my life, it isn't what I wanted to do. I like being and I want to be hands-on. And you can't do that and be very hands-on. So anyway, my program is I hope I live a long time because I'd like to keep this going for quite a while. I love what I do. I'd be, I'd be lost without it. Uh, financially, it's been difficult the last year or so. Uh, and so it hasn't, certainly financially, it hasn't been something you would go out of your way to do, hardly. But that's not why I ever did it. And if I can afford it, I want to keep doing it. And we have some interesting shows going forward. I'm interested in all of them. Robert, I can't uh, tell you how much I appreciate you spending the time with us. I hope it's been valuable from your point of view. I hope we've, I've enjoyed being with you, and I respect being with you very greatly. I have enjoyed it, too. Thank you.